here we are. All right. So, yeah, I had a lot of trouble getting things started. That's why I have a green screen instead of a background, because that wouldn't work this morning. But we are here with uh, Jay Widener. And this is really exciting. He wrote an amazing book, and it's, you know, right here. Um, you know, uh, the Mysteries of the Cross of Hende. And we're going to chat about that and just uh, some other stuff that, that comes up. So I am glad that you're here and that we uh, connect it. Uh, how are things this morning? Uh, things are good. It's a really nice day here. It's like 60 degrees and beautiful out. Mm. Well, you know, I thought I'd start chatting with a little icebreaker. Here's something unique that just happened. I thought I'd uh, see what you thought. So, of course, we all know Robert Felix, the uh, the late Robert Felix, unfortunately, um, who wrote Magnetic Reversals and Evolutionary Leaps. And something that happened the other night, um, we were downtown Scottsdale uh, enjoying a night out and drank a glass or two of wine. And, you know, our, our KP index has been kind of high recently, of course. We had the uh, the CME. And so we're still, that was sixes and sevens on the KP index. But now we're still doing threes and fours, you know. So it's still pretty elevated and has been for a while. So, you know, I drank just two glasses of wine that would usually amount to nothing. And uh, both of us drank about the same. And we were um, uncomfortably really drunk. And I was wondering, you know, a lot. I, I wonder if the uh, as we're entering our grand solar minimum, we have more cosmic rays coming in. We just had kind of a good deal of a high KP index. I wonder if uh, if that can make us more sensitive to everything from alcohol to vitamins to hallucinogens and such like that. I would say definitely, and I'll, um, we know from the. Uh, dance mania that happened during in Europe during the last Mondra minimum that there's something that happens where people literally lose their minds and um, I suspect that's really what's going on in the world today uh, everybody blames all, all the problems on social media but I'm not so sure about that <clears throat> I think it might have to do more with crazy space weather and getting zapped and I think that uh, um, everybody has to be really careful right now. I live, uh, you know, at, at 8,000 feet, Southern Colorado, and man, whew, the uh, uh, radiation here is just been over the top. You know, they say, oh, 10 out of 10, right? For, 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 for you know, the, the x-rays coming in and all that. Hell, we're 14, <laughs> right? I mean, it is just amazing. I mean, I know guys that work outside and they say, man, I'm like fried by one o'clock, right? It's, it's just amazing. Yeah, the sun definitely is changing as we, well, for one thing, enter the, the grand solar minimum. And um, we've had David Dubine on. He's a friend of ours. We've talked about the grand solar minimum you know, quite a lot. Actually, the last time I, I met Robert Phoenix in person was David Dubine and I were chatting with Robert Felix, you know. And uh, something he mentioned to us was that he felt that this, this cycle was going to be really epic was going to be uh, unusually intense, he, he was predicting. He didn't really give reasons why, but he, he thought that this was going to be quite the cycle. Well, Far Farmer's Almanac is saying it's going to be a bad winter. And um, we already have in Colorado, uh, we were at 600% snowpack last week. Um, got a little warm now, so a lot of it may have gone, but uh, we had an amazing amount of snow. I was driving through the whole state, and it's was like, whoa, uh, every mountain had snow on it. So um, I think we're definitely moving into that time period where it's going to get uh, heavy duty, and uh, you, everyone should be really prepared. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, that's all I do. That's what I've been doing all morning. All morning, I've just been preparing, prepping for the future that I don't know is going to happen. So, you know, you got to, you got to buy the right foods and get the right storage. And it's, it's, it's hard work and it's, it's expensive. And, um, but it's just going to get more expensive. So you might as well do it because your dollars are worthless um, almost nowadays. Um, I got so uh, pissed off. But last week, I just went and took a huge amount of money out of my bank where it's not making a dime, mm -hmm. right? 
and I bought um, Ethereum and Bitcoin. I've already bought a lot of a lot of that stuff, but uh, I wanted to prove a point to my wife, right? Because she's like, "Oh my God, oh, right? You're taking our money!" And then I, I showed her today. Oh, look, we've already made two thousand eight hundred dollars off that money, right? That that I took out. I said we were making nothing before. It sat there for years, not making one dime, and now I've already made twenty eight hundred bucks. And I think that, you know, you have to start thinking that way. You know, there's a whole different world right now, and we're moving into a crisis. Or we're in the crisis. We're moving into a, a never-ending crisis. Um, and the powers that be are not leading us in any kind of way, at least our country, in any kind of way that, that makes any sense. I mean, at least China's telling everybody to hoard food and, and, and things for the coming winter. And we're, we're there. Our government acts like there's nothing going on. Everything's fine. And, you know, it, it, it so we're moving into that period where, yeah, you got to be uh, head on a swivel, um, watch for weird things going on, watch for weird people, especially that. That's the one thing you really got to watch for is weird strangers that are interested in you, you know, and, uh, so uh, it's going to be weird. And, you know, and I, I fortunately, I live in an area where I, I, I can't call any, any police or anything because they'll never get here. So I've been here now for three and a half years and I'm like ready. You know, I've, I've taken every precaution that I can and, and I'm ready for anything that happens. But, you know, there's always that one thing that you weren't thinking of. And so the Yalta, it's, 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 a, it's a big thing and we're going into it. And the, We'll know by the end of this winter, I believe, whether the d prediction, the dire predictions that are going happening are going to happen or whether it's not going to be as bad as we think. And I, what I'd really look for is uh, watch Canada. I'd watch Canada's weather. If Canada's weather starts really going south, then um, that, that's not, that doesn't bode well. And so we'll see, you know. Yeah. Well, I think one thing I wanted to touch on as we get started talking about deeper things, or well, we are, we, we're already talking about deep things, but is you have a fundraiser going on. And I definitely wanted to direct people to that. And so could you touch on that? Just basically what it's about. And because you're in a very, very unique situation. And, um, you know, hopefully we can help you make some money towards your fundraiser. Well, I, I'm getting sued by a guy named Corey Good. I was his producer for his show at Gaia. And um, uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he had an ironclad contract with Gaia. And he didn't want to be with them anymore, but they owned all of his stuff because he signed a contract. And mm -hmm. um, then he started raising a lot of trouble and trying to really hurt Gaia and me in particular, and I fought back on my reality check show. Uh, I did, I think, eight programs on it, and uh, I hit back pretty hard. I'm, I'm, I always punch back when I get punched. And um, uh, he eventually wrote me a, a, an email saying he was going to take everything I have, all the stuff here. And then, um, then he sued me on March 17th of 2020, uh, way over a year and a half ago. And we're in... I spent a lot of money because I, again, I'm, I'm going to punch back. And so I, I spent a lot of money and got in a lot of fights with my wife about it. She told me to shut up. I did shut up eventually. And I'm not going to say much more because mm -hmm. uh, my lawyers have told me not to, but um, yeah. so eventually I realized that I was not alone in the, in the, the consciousness community that we're all in danger. Uh, you are in danger of being sued. You could say the wrong thing. And someone could, you know, it's frivolous, but still a lawsuit. You still got to defend yourself. If you don't defend yourself, you're going to lose. So you have to. Now, Cliff High, my good friend Cliff High, he defended himself masterfully, but his was easier than mine. Mine is much more complicated. So I, and so then I realized that everybody's in danger, 
and that I needed to create a fund that would help me, yes, but more than that, create a slush fund where somebody gets in trouble, like I, like I got into trouble with a frivolous lawsuit that's going to be thrown out of court, I know for sure, uh, it, you know, but you still have to spend the money. So I decided I'm going to, and I may continuously do this because I, I'm suspecting there's a lot more of us out there than we know because I'm a more well-known person, so people know about it. But, you know, you could be a guy with only, you know, 500 people watching your YouTube and all of a sudden you find yourself in a lawsuit over some innocent remark that you made about a public figure. And the public figure, let me put it to you this way. I can say whatever I want about Joe Biden. Anything. I'm not, I can't say I want to go kill him or something, but I can criticize him and criticize him because he's a public figure, just like Trump. Same thing with Trump. Say anything I want about Trump because he's a public figure. He chose to be a public figure. Mm -hmm. So did very good. I chose to be a public figure maybe in a more reticent way because I was publicizing my books and, and my films, and somehow I, I got everyone wanted to interview me, but I, I, I'm more of a reticent public figure. I don't really, I don't go to, I don't talk at conferences very much or anything like that. I do like to give people who are um, doing podcasts like you help because, you know, uh, people helped me when I was coming up and I figure I have to help them, uh, uh, others at this stage of my life. So anyway, I decided that I would raise some money and I'm not going to be like really, um, vigorous at it it's just a small thing i'm not i'm not i'm not begging anyone for money if you don't want to help me that's fine i won't hurt you hate you or anything like that and um but you know anyone that does want to help <clears throat> i promise you that once i get my cost paid off i will take the rest of the money and give it back into the community to help stop this kind of frivolous bs mm. I like it. Yeah, well, definitely. We will link to that in the in the description. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, and the thing is, whether a person's big or whether they're a smaller channel, I mean, a, a smaller channel is almost easier to go after, it's you know. And is. and the thing is, is I guess no, I like what you're doing because we do have to watch what we say these days. It gets very difficult. I mean, uh, it's one of the reasons we don't really try too hard on radiant creators to make any money because we because. Um, how would I put it? It's easier just to say what you want to say. Here's the thing I found that if you don't try to monetize your videos, YouTube in general doesn't really care what you say. But the moment you try to monetize it, then they get very uptight. And that's when you end up with strikes and things like that. And so we just figure we do a video, we put it on several platforms. And if YouTube kicks it off, we just, oh, well, you know, we're doing this yep. just because we're doing it. Um, yep. But I would say for, you know, content creators, of course, that censorship well, the censorship, of course, by YouTube, but then also the uh, frivolous lawsuits, it, it it can be very devastating because if you defend yourself, you know, legally, um, people may not know this who haven't been in that situation, but you can be out like thirty or fifty thousand dollars in no easy. time. Easy. easy. That's just easy. <laughs> Unbelievable what they charge for. Every paperclip costs four bucks. You know, it's like yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like it, it costs, you know, 500 bucks to leave your lawyer a message. <laughs> it does. I won't do it. I won't email. I won't, I won't call. I was like, forget it. Yeah, <laughs> and, that's uh, expensive. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, but, you know, the chances are really, really, really high that it's dismissed. It was poorly filed. She's like a country lawyer, his lawyer, and, um, you know, and going up against, Gaia's New York lawyer firm, who's like experts in cyber stalking and cyber. Mm. Uh, and that's where most of the activity that we think that that the uh, the plaintiff was doing to hurt the stock value of guy and me personally, we think that he that, that so this firm is an expert in that. So you do not want these guys looking into your Internet history. <laughs> you cannot mm. hide. From these guys so um they've got a great law firm and i've got a really great law firm uh, one of the top in, in colorado and um you know i just said sick them and we're counter suing we're bam, bam you know and i want all my money back yeah um, i like it yep. yeah 
And if and I, I get think, that I think, money back, then I'll put that into the fund, by the way. Mm. No, I like it. I think the, uh, in, in general, the community likes what you're doing too, for sure. Well, um, your amazing book, uh, uh, The Mysteria, uh, Mysteries of the Great Cross of Hendai, uh, Alchemy and the End of Time. So definitely wanted to talk about that a little bit. Well, maybe a lot of bit, actually. Well, you talked to League Project recently, and that's where I, 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 I first saw your, your, your work when you're talking to Rex Bear. And that was a great, great chat you guys had. And uh, definitely you did two videos, an hour each, a series with our Randall Carlson, where you guys went kind of deep dived into the Cross of Hinde. So I'll link to all that. That's out there. Um, but referencing some things that you and him, uh, that, that came up in those interviews, and also I, 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 I power read a lot of your, your book here, definitely. And so maybe we could start. Just because I, mean, I know there's people who are you know listening to this who don't know what the cross of Hende is, so I shouldn't assume they did, that they do. So maybe could, could could you give us a brief insight on what is the cross of Hende? Uh, well, I believe the cross of Hende is probably one of the most important single monuments on Earth, and uh, its information that it conveys is the most important information that can be conveyed, and it echoes. It's the information that it gives is echoed in various other traditions from the Vedic to the Freemasonic to um, European alchemy uh, to Egypt, uh, uh, even the Inca and the um, Aztecs here in the, in the, in the New World. And, um, and because essentially an eschatological message um it uh it what it does is it's like a big magnet and it pulls in all of these different esoteric traditions and you realize that the very basis of esotericism is this relationship that we as humans and our planet have with the sun and that is the secret of alchemy and all the other things. So the sun, um, the sun has a peculiar rotation. Its uh, equator rotates at 37 days, I think, and then the poles are 26 days. And what this does is it, it electromagnetically, it begins intertwining. They begin overlapping and overlapping and, and building up this electromagnetic tension yeah, as they overlap, as, as it rotates and spins. And this takes a long time for it to get to a point where it decides that, you know, it needs to get rid of all this tension. And then, and this is what I've come to believe, and this is, isn't in the book as much uh, as research I've done since the book with, of course, Soho and all these other things that are coming out that just really helped me because the book was... 16, a long time ago, 16 years ago, I wrote it. And um, so every 400 years or so, the, this tension straightens itself out. And what that does is that releases a plasma storm that comes out of the, out of the sun. And it's, it's, it's both a coronal mass ejection, which is a flare, giant solar flare. But what is a solar flare? So I could argue that a solar flare is actually akin to a gigantic lightning strike. And when it hits, it hits with a force that's just freaking unbelievable. And the, uh, the thunder is so loud, it will make you go deaf. And um, I believe the Grand Canyon is a result of, mm -hmm. of one of these strikes. And I believe all the planets, uh, hard planets, uh, Mercury has a gigantic canyon. Um, so does Venus. So does Mars. Uh, uh, Mars is even bigger than the Grand Canyon, and uh, they all have that look of a lightning strike, all four of them. And so I believe that, you know, Velikovsky was probably right in a lot of what he was musing in his books, and, um, and the Cross of Hende describes this event that was in the past and is going to be in the future. And essentially, that when the right cycles of time line up when the right forces line up this event happens 
And I believe we're very, very close to it happening right now. And I believe the elites know this and have been running from this since the late 1950s when uh, the first mention of the Cross of Hende by Falconelli is, uh, goes public. So Falconelli writes a book called Mysteries of the Cathedrals, which is a, a almost impenetrable book uh, that is filled with all sorts of information and, and things that are very arcane. Uh, essentially, the message in the book is everything you know and everything you're taught is, is wrong. And you need to just clean the slate and start all over. And that's a bitch, let me tell you. So uh, the Cross of Hende is telling us um, uh, when and also where you can go. Um, I, I, Fulcanelli intimates that the Latin inscription on the top of the cross is telling you where there, there's a place of refuge. And I, you know, spent look, about two years uh, deciphering it and came up with you know, Inca Cave, Cusco, Peru, and also Hail to the Cross at Urcos. Urcos is a small town about 20 miles away from Cusco, Peru. So I immediately jumped on a plane and went to Cusco and got into all the caves that were in the area. And back in those days, nobody cared. And so I had carte blanche to just about go anywhere I wanted. So I spent literally three weeks just going in, in the case, spelunking uh, with, uh, you know, native guides. And, um, and yeah, yeah, you could get a lot of people in those caves. So, and of course the, the Inca have a uh, Atahualpa, their great God. He went into the caves and took the Inca people with him uh, during this great, storm, the solar storm that happened a long time ago. That's the legend. And when the storm was over, Atahualpa came out of the cave and the Inca people were restored. The same is true about the Hopi. The ant people took the Hopi into Mount Blanca. And uh, there's cave systems in Mount Blanca in Colorado. And they stayed there until they weathered out the storm and uh, the, the solar storm. And they asked, uh, the Hopi are, are very consistent in this and what they say about, about it. And um, again, the Aztecs are tearing the hearts out of people. Why? To appease the angry sun, to make sure it doesn't get angry. And it was, you know, their superstition. But, you know, again, it's reinforcing this entire thing that every once in a while, you know, the sun lets out a burp that just really fries our ass. And then we go over to the Mahabharata and we find, you know, that um, uh, 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 you know, I have a, a mind a mind blow here. Uh, uh, Vishnu at the end of time uh, uh, creates his fire and has to cleanse the earth uh, of the Kali Yuga. So the Kali Yuga is so corrupt and so evil and. And even the animals are bad, right? And and so he has to boom, and he, and he blows a, a flare or whatever at the uh, at the earth and fries the entire planet, and then he remakes uh, life again. And, and since everything, all the evil has been burned, all the bad stuff has been burned, we can now have a golden age. This is their theory. I'm just using that because. Again, it intersects so uh, incredible with the Cross of Hende. So the Cross of Hende was built around 1600. It has four panels, each with kind of fairy tale drawings on it. It's got a Greek pillar. It's got a, a Celtic cross at the top with a Latin inscription on one side and I-N-R-I, -I, which is the famous Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Although in alchemy, it means in fire, nature is renewed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, of course, reflecting what the cross is about. And so the cross has four A's, which mark time. Uh, and, and on the other side of the four A's is the fairy tale moon, because the moon also marks time. So the two things that mark time, the procession of the equinox, which is the four A's, and the monthly cycle is how we keep time in long term and short term. Right. And then on the other two panels is the fairy tale I mean, the star, the eight-pointed star, and the uh, angry sun, which is kind of blowing out. And then the Celtic cross has the Latin inscription, which means, uh, hail the cross, our only hope, 
but it, it, it's got a, a fault in it in which one of the letters is moved down. So it'd be like the United States state. And then the next word, sub America, right? It would be like that, right? S-O-V instead of O-V. And the S would be true. So Fulconelli wisely points out that that mistake could never have been made. It was mm -hmm. a, a very a talented mason that made this. He would have drawn it with chalk on the on the stone before he did it. He, he would have made it. So it clearly has another meaning. And that other meaning is it's telling you where to go. Interestingly enough, the rumors were after the OSS, the precursors to the CIA, went into France at the end of World War II to find Fulconelli. He escaped, I heard this from good sources, he escaped to Peru with Marconi. Marconi and Fulconelli both split and went to Peru to some secret place there that they wanted to get away because now they realized that Fulconelli's book had alerted the people in the intelligence agencies that this guy knew far more than he should know, especially about nuclear things. And they were very concerned that he was some kind of um, spy or agent or something. And Fulconelli says, no, I come from a tradition where this stuff's been known for like 5,000, maybe 20,000, maybe 50,000 years. So, um, and, and, and so in that you also, within that you say, okay, who built the cross of Hende? Right. Well, um, it was obviously a secret society that knew this information and had been passed down to them year, generation after generation. And, and so they felt or were compelled. And some people say that the cross of Hende was just rebuilt. In other words, there was a cross there before that had the same information, but it began deteriorating. So in 1600, the uh, the guy, uh, a mason, someone, rebuilt the cross of Hende. He took more stone, new stone, and rebuilt so that the information would be saved. Now here we are 400 years later, and the yeah. cross of Hende is falling apart. Uh, it's, it's right next to a very busy road, and, it, and the, uh, uh, the, all the exhaust is beginning to erode. The, uh, the cross. And pretty soon you're not going to be able to see anything on the cross because it's going to be completely eroded, which begs the question, is the time to rebuild the cross of Hende so that other generations can have it? I think every 400 years the cross of Hende is rebuilt. And another interesting thing about this is the town of uh, 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 the town that it's in, which I we call Hende, is actually pronounced Undai, but if you pronounce it in British English, in British English, the H at the beginning of the word is always dropped. So herb becomes herb, Harry becomes airy, um, uh, Henry becomes Henry. Uh, so Hende would become Ende. Uh, so we have this, you know, uh, joke within the, in English, within the, the naming of, of the town uh, of where it sits. And uh, so we have a, a constant allusions to people being very interested in the cross of Hende. Hitler was very interested in the cross mm -hmm. of Hende. And when he went to the town of Hende to meet with Franco in 1939, he um, uh, had got his, he like, pulled right in the train yard. Uh, the cross is right up the, the hill from the train yard. Uh, and he got grabbed his dogs, his two German shepherds, and he walked right up the hill. Didn't say anything to anybody. Everybody's like, ah, he's not taking his guards. And he walked right up to the cross of Hende, and it's, it's, it's said that there was a person there waiting for him, and they had a very long discussion. <clears throat> I believe that I believe that World War II was a very terrible thing, and I believe a lot of people died. Okay, I'm not denying any of that. I'm not, and I believe there are very evil people involved in that war on every side. But I also believe that World War II was a cover for a series of missions by the Germans into various areas of the world from Peru to Tibet, to North Africa, to the Asian countries, 
and they were searching for something and they were searching for something in a uh, antarctica in a almost desperate fashion and i believe that they knew that this world was short-lived and they were looking for an escape route uh somewhere uh that they had talked to the right people who had interpreted the cross in the correct way and uh we know they were in peru we know that they were in tibet and they were looking for the tunnel systems in both places there's no doubt about it and uh, they were they were in tibet in 33 34 looking for the tunnel systems we know that roosevelt sent um oh don't let me blow his name the artist the Russian artist, whose name I'm going to completely blow here, I'll probably get it in a couple minutes. Roosevelt, FDR sent the Russian artist Nikolai, almost had it, to uh, Tibet, uh, ostensibly to uh, just draw what was there, but clearly where he went, uh, Roche, Nicholas. I'll get it in a second here. A uh, very mm -hmm. famous artist. In fact, the first Ghostbusters movie was filmed, the ending was filmed on the ceiling, on the roof of that museum. Rorick, Nicholas Rorick. The Nicholas Rorick Museum is where they filmed, and Dan Aykroyd is super into all of this, by the way. And he oh, wrote wow. So, um, uh, so Nicholas Rorick goes to Tibet, and he's clearly looking for uh, the Shambhala, the underground world. Uh, he's not making any doubt. He, he goes to the llamas and he's asking, "Is there? Can I see the tunnel system?" And and then there was a a, a book uh, uh, by a Russian called uh, named Osendowski. I think it's called Gods and Men, and it came out in like the twenties, thirties mm -hmm. maybe, late thirties. Yeah, uh, it, it happened though in the late twenties. And he went to Tibet and he got into the underground and he met with the so-called king of the world, which is supposedly the underground ruler who is waiting his time to come out. And of course, he, well, if, you, if you were an underground race, why are you living underground? Two, one. And two, what do you mean you're waiting for the right time to come out and conquer the uh, outside world? Well, they're waiting for the sun to do its thing and then it'll be safe for another 400 years. So uh, it, it's all the lore. That's why the cross of Hende is so mind blowing because it is this magnet that sucks in all the esotericism, all the mythical histories uh, and everything until you finally realize that some genius forefather, foremother of ours was smart enough to put this on in stone and smart enough to create a society that would pass down all of this vital information so that we would be prepared when the time comes. And, um, you know, there's a, a so the, the cross of Hende predicts what we call a double catastrophe. And what is a double catastrophe? <clears throat> well, the uh, angry sun panel has four like objects like little stars around it i believe that the first catastrophe was uh the giant comet that came in and broke into four pieces which is the four horsemen of the apocalypse broke into four pieces one piece hit canada one piece hit russia uh hit the northern part of the world and just blasted the crap out of the place and created what we call the younger dryas which is a 1400 year period where things got so cold here mm -hmm. on planet earth that even like as far south as um uh like iran southern iran were freezing cold uh the myths from like even near the equator were that they, they got snow uh, and, and it got really bad and all the animals died all the big animals died almost immediately but we almost died out our species almost died out and it was one of the most terrifying events that's ever happened in human history and we kind of pulled out of it because what happened and this is according to dr robert shock's work he's the boston university geologist who discovered that the aging of the Sphinx was much more pervasive. And we can get to the Sphinx, too, because it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, he 
wrote a book called uh, Forgotten Civilization about how the younger Dryas was stopped by a gigantic solar flare. But here, you know, here we were, the human race, we're down to our last few thousand people and it's freezing cold and, and, you know, we're dying and we can't grow food because there's summers are so short and, and we're, you know, chewing through the last of the animal population, probably eating bark off of trees and whatever we could to stay alive. Then all of a sudden this gigantic solar flare hits. And while it's nice to get warm, it's another whole thing to get warm that fast. So yeah. what happened is, is that, uh, we, and this is all historically valid. When I'm telling you, I'm not making anything up. The the giant ice caps that were created during the Younger Dryas melted instantly, and all of a sudden, in the, and Randall Carlson talks about this: the the flood that came through Washington State and just tore everything away, created the uh, the river, and uh, the Columbia River, and uh, it, it just tore everything out. It was this amazing flood. And the oceans rose 300 feet at the end of the Younger Dryas. So all the cities, if there were any out there from the previous civilizations that had survived during the Younger Dryas, they were all washed away by the rising tides. We'll never know what they are unless we think. So um, that's the double catastrophe. First, we were smacked in by the uh, breaking up of this gigantic comet that nearly killed us in the Younger Dryas. And thankfully, I guess, the Younger Dryas ended with a gigantic solar flare, which we immediately went for probably raised the temperature uh, a medium of 30, 40 degrees on the planet, uh, like overnight. It'd be like that mm -hmm. sudden. And, uh, you know, giant forest fires happened and, you um, uh, 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 ash. There's ash like 18 inches deep in Canada where these giant forest fires happen uh, in the areas where forests could still grow during the Younger Dryas because there were warm places. Alaska was kind of warm during the Younger We don't know why either. Alaska was warm during the Younger Dryas and so was like center Canada. And that's where we find all the dust, all the um, ash. Now, so there was giant flat fires and and, you know, this even, I know this is weird, but this even, all of this information I'm conveying to you, weirdly enough, is even on one of the murals at the uh, Denver airport. Yes. Uh, I, I call it the extinction mural, which has three coffins in front, and then all the forests are on fire. And then we see all of the extinct animals, the dodo bird and the whale and all these extinct animals. And in the three coffins, weirdly enough, is a young white girl, a young black girl, and a Native American. But no Asian is in the extinction um, mural, weirdly enough. So um, uh, so the three of the four races are, are, are in the mural, and they're extinct and in coffins. So I don't know what that means, you know. I, I mean, I know the Denver Airport is one of the strangest places on Earth. And uh, mm. and I, now I, I was actually in the middle of this research – in 1994, when the airport opened, and I got invited to come to Denver from my home in, in uh, the Seattle area, and so I flew to the airport. Oh, I'm going to get to see this brand new airport. So I took you know an extra 40 minutes to walk around the airport. I find the Freemasonic plaque. I find the um, gargoyle, just like the cathedral. Yeah. I find the um, the murals. And then I find the extinction mural and I'm just like, my jaw is like dropped to the floor as I realize it that, and later I did find out, by the way, uh, I got, uh, I, I found some seriously ancient, rare Freemasonic books and, <clears throat> and they used um, like metal plating, you know, in those days, uh, their drawings were like on metal plate, although they looked like, like photographs, but the overall arching theme of this book, which was very rare and very revered by the upper crust of the Freemasons, was all about fire, all about the sun, all about fire, all about preserving your lineage. Uh, I, the whole thing was about that. And then I'll, I'll, I'll end all of this uh, description by uh, my discovery in a Indian text called the Puranas. Uh, uh, they're very difficult to read. 
but um, the Puranas are very ancient texts that come from the Dravidian culture in southern India. And in this Purana text, it clearly says that before the world is destroyed by fire, they the gods made giant arcs. And they went in these giant arcs and they went to a planet called Mahar, M-A-H-A-R, where they waited out the storm. And then after the storm was over and everything was cool again, they came back and restarted life. Mm. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, the uh, the uh, IRNI on the uh, Cross of Hende, uh, it really struck me in your book where you translate that into uh, in fire, nature is renewed. Yep. And um, you also touched on Ka being that, so when the body dies, uh, in India, they'll they'll burn the body to release the ka that that uh, life force that stays attached to that body. So if we were really going to have a a changing of ages, truly, like if all is going to be renewed by fire, then that basically ka of basically life on the planet to some extent would have to be burned off. If there was going to be let's say an evolutionary leap, then that's that's going to be you know if you're if you're uh, sun facing at that moment, it's going to be a pretty bad day. It's going to be a seriously bad day. It'll be a Thursday at two o'clock, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna be a bad hair day for sure for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, and you're right. It, it, we don't know how long the coronal. So so I want to emphasize that there's this gigantic thing that happens every twelve thousand years. This gigantic yes. coronal mass ejection of this buildup of energies in the sun, but there's minor bursts about every 400 years, about exactly 400 years ago when the Cross of Hende was built. If you remember, um, if you know your history and you know the, the uh, pilgrims arrived in, I think, 1612 uh, to Plymouth Rock, and, 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 and it was so cold that they couldn't grow any food. That's what the Thanksgiving is about, is that they were so cold that they couldn't grow any food and so uh, a, a group of Native Americans that lived nearby who knew where all the turkeys were went out and shot a bunch of turkeys and brought it to them and gave it to them. And that's where the Thanksgiving ritual uh, comes from. And it's because they were in the Maunder Minimum. They couldn't have picked a worse time to, to come to America. And and actually all the way up until, and, and don't forget, George Washington crossed the Delaware because it was frozen. So, I mean, it, it never freezes now. It hasn't, I don't think it's frozen in, in my lifetime. But um, uh, so uh, we can see the ebb and flow of this thing. Now, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that the punctuated ones, not the overall one that blasts the earth and fries it, but the punctuated ones that are every 400 years hit different parts at different times. And they're not just at 400 years. They're, they're, they're little bursts also that happen. And I think the Chicago fire of 1876 was one of these little bursts because it wasn't just Chicago that burned. It was like five different towns on Lake Michigan also burned that day. So I think something came down and hit, hit and just, you know, and you don't know it because you don't know it. It's coming at the speed of light. Um, you don't really know what happened and you don't know. It was it just a lightning strike or was it something that came from the sun? And uh, you know, what's the difference? And, uh, you know, these are, these are things that have to be answered. But within those contexts of, of understanding the plasma nature of the sun and our universe, you come to realize that the entire universe is made out of plasma. 99.99% .99 of the universe is made out of plasma. So therefore, all these things that I'm talking about are normal consequences of living in the plasma universe. They're going to have all of these things happen. And, you know, um, I, uh, I've been touring the American Southwest quite a bit in the last year uh, with all the COVID crap. I can't really go anywhere, so I just jump in my car and sleep in my car. And uh, I've been going to southern Utah and northern Arizona. And, you know, it's just, dang, like the strangest place on Earth. And I mean, it is so weird. There's spires that just 
pop out of nowhere and yes uh, ship rock ship is just completely bizarre and uh, you know and then if you hike in you'll find more and more of these and and clearly the, this is the result of a giant plasma strike okay there's no doubt about it they've done in the electric universe they've taken like slate and they blast it with electricity and it looks like arizona when it, when 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 they stop the experiment, it looks like Southern Utah with the arches. That's how the arches are formed. There's this electricity boring its way through the center of the thing and just leaving the arch. And so, <clears throat> of course, the Native Americans believe that like the arches in Arches National Park are like portals in other dimensions. And if you understand portals and what they are, they're super high plasma charges. So in so so. Uh, even even uh, interdimensional travel is involved in all of this knowledge about the electric universe and plasma charges and where charges are built up. So if you have an arch that's made out of electromagnetic material, uh, th then you're going to get this. Uh, you know, it depends on what time of day, what time of year. If it's cold out, it's probably not going to work as well. So there's all these different variables. That's what alchemy is. Alchemy is studying all the things around you and knowing when the right moment to move is right. And, mm -hmm. and, and so you have to be vitally aware. Um, but, but, but people have disappeared in those arches. I, I know for sure. So, uh, and this might explain a lot of the missing 411 things also uh, certain places get charged up for whatever reason, right? It could be a hundred million reasons why a, a certain place near two rocks suddenly starts getting a plasma charge going uh, uh, and, and a, a hiker or somebody, a hunter or something, walks through the plasma charge and, and they disappear. And then the plasma charge dissipates and, you know, no, no, nobody knows what happened. And, I, you know, I, and I've actually run that by uh, David Politis and he went, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Because a lot of the times the missing are, missing instantly so mm -hmm. the person at the back of the line you know they just were talking to the person next to them and then the person turns around and they're gone and then and frequently you'll, you'll say yeah i heard like a electrical charge in the air for a second right and it's like yep that's what you would hear just like with ufos and people see ufos what's the first thing you, you ask them what did you hear and they go oh it was like electricity popping off right that's because ufos are also a plasma something using plasma or they are plasma or both or whatever. But once we understand that we're surrounded by this plasma universe, a lot of the paranormal stuff becomes a lot easier to understand. And you realize that, you know, the Ka, which is the, the, the part of your being that is attached to your body, um, is probably plasma, um, mm. invisible plasma. That sometimes we can see as ghosts. You know, you look like the, your dear departed one because that, the, taking the form of the body of the of the person and and people hang on to their car. That's what ghosts are. They're people who can't let go, and you know, so you got to let go at death. You know, goodbye. It's really much better after it, you go than it is here. And um, as one who's almost died a couple times, and um, so uh, you know, at death, what death is is it's the you you have. You have your plasma sphere around you with the with the spine as the center magnet access point, uh, and that's why you have to keep your posture and do yoga mm -hmm. and all other stuff. And when you die, the, this field collapses until it's wrapped around your spine, and then it begins going up the spine, and it comes out the top of the head. And, and you have an umbilical cord right now, you do and I do, that's attached to the larger plasma sphere that surrounds the earth. And when you're born, that's why that spot on your head stays soft for a while because, you know, it needs to develop you a, a lot more because you had to get out of the womb because your head's so damn big, you're going to kill your mom. So you got to get out of the womb at nine months or you'll kill your mom. And so then the uh, plasma uh, uh, field isn't done working with you. So your head stays soft right there for a few months while it zzz, zapping electricity into your head and getting you complete. And when your head finally heals up, and you're now a complete human being. So you aren't really a complete human being until a couple of months after you're born. And um, 
So uh, all of us are attached to this larger plasma sphere. And that's what astral travel is. You travel up that, that stem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Shushuma in, in Vedic uh, t uh, 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 technology or techno terms. It's a uh, one millionth as wide as a human hair. And uh, it's invisible. And so the Earth is surrounded by this uh, giant, giant, huge, invisible plasma cloud. And we're at the bottom of the sea, of this plasma sea. We're at the very bottom. We live on the bottom of the sea. We're surrounded by an ocean that we don't even know. And the ocean's filled with entities that we can't see, but see us. And hmm. um, these entities are very interested in us. And uh, they can help you or hurt you, depending on, on you know, who you are and what you're doing. So, uh, and when you die, you go back up into that plasma sphere. And there's, you know, many layers to this plasma sphere. And what you do on this planet during your life determines which plasma sphere you go to when you're dead. So if you're um, Orthodox, Jewish or Christian or Islam, uh, and you're in you know, stern belief systems, you go to that first layer. And with that first layer, because they're not teaching you bad things. But some of the things they're teaching you aren't right. And so you go to that first layer to kind of get retaught about, well, you know, there that thing about reincarnation doesn't exist. Well, you can actually see it does exist. So uh, maybe they were wrong about that, right? So you go through, you know, it's a soul learning process. And then if you're really, you know, um, if you practice your, you know, your light body meditations and, and you live a really clean life and you're kind to people and animals and and you love everybody and um, and you're not afraid of death. Uh, then you go up to the higher spheres. If you're really good, you go all the way out to the better, which is the release sphere, which is where you're released from this place. And that's the goal of all esotericists and all alchemists is eventually reach that seventh sphere so that we can get the hell out of here. And, and, and they say that you can't reach that seventh sphere until you've learned every single thing about the 3D world, which means you, you need to know physics, astronomy, astrology, chemistry, history, music, uh, geometry, you know. And so the practiced mind has to uh, wake up every day with those disciplines. You know, what, what am I going to look at today that's going to make me a better, a better person in, in this light? You know, what am I going to read? What am I going to study? And, you know, the, 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 the purpose, purposeful life is a, a person who realizes that they don't know anything, and every day they know that. And so every day they try to get better at what they don't know. And so I always... Um, buy books that I'm against. I'll go to mm. a book bookstore and I will buy a book that I'm totally against. I just bought a book on Mormonism, you know, and I don't know anything about Mormonism at all. Nothing. I, I, I look at their religion. I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed by it. I don't understand any of it, but I'm going to find out all about it. Right. And I, and I will be more tolerant towards Mormons after I finish reading the book. So uh, that's what happens. You know, you read a book uh, about something that you know nothing about. And pretty soon, you know, you become more tolerant about those things that you don't know anything about. Mark Twain said, beware of travel. It removes prejudice and opens the mind. So, you know, that's that's exactly right. Travel is another thing that, that a human being should be doing, which they don't want us to do anymore. Oh, really yeah. Great. It reminds me of something uh, John McNamara said. He was the uh, I guess Secretary of Defense under, I know, uh, Johnson. Yeah. And um, uh, he made a, a very cool documentary called The Fog of War. And it's really worth watching if people haven't seen it. Um, doesn't really matter if you, you know, like McNamara or not. He definitely has a lot of experience to, to write, to, to, uh, to yep. make a little documentary. And he was pretty harshly interviewed by some, by some people. But he he was he's, he's a tough guy, and one of the uh, rules, and there are, you can you can find it up if you if you search for it on, on on the internet, you will find their their listed his rules. But one of them is that uh, one of America's biggest problems throughout the wars that he had seen is that we didn't have any idea who we were fighting. 
we really did not as a, as a people nor as a military or, or a government, we didn't know who we were fighting. We didn't know why they were there. And if we'd understood that it would have been a very different situation. Yeah, that was a fog of war came out right when the United States was beginning to realize that um, we were getting completely clobbered by China. Uh, that there was this consensus that started about 20 years ago that, wait a minute, maybe just maybe these relationships with China is not a good thing. Maybe there's something else going on. And then they began learning about Chinese energies uh, and that all Chinese people believe in these different kinds of energies. And one of the things is never teach a Westerner about these energies, right? And one of these energies is called Xi, S-H-I. And its <laughs> energy is never, always get someone else to fight your war for you. Right? Mm. right? And, and, and never, uh, and, and that was what was going on in Vietnam. They were using the Americans' really clumsy mannerisms about trying to save the Catholics in North Vietnam, and they used that to get the Vietnamese all pissed off at the Americans. Then they secretly funded them with arms that the U.S. never knew about, and that was what that war was, was a, a bleed down by, by China in a brilliantly executed move, and they're still doing it. <laughs> they're still doing it. If you look at Chinese... Um, mythology and, and literature, uh, their hero is never the guy that, you know, saved his family and his, and his community from evil. And that's not it. In Chinese mythology, it's the most deceptive guy is the guy that they, mm. that they worship and want. And they learned this from the, the war period where there was a, all the clans were at war with each other. And the, 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 the clan that won that horrible war uh, was the one that was the most deceptive and got everybody else to do the fighting for him. And that's where the concept of she comes from. And there's all these other concepts. And, and now we're learning about them. And now we're seeing how the Chinese mind operates. And it's a much more uh, practical mysticism, you might say, uh, than we ever were thought. We all thought they were just, you know, not mystical, that they were just these practical you know, guys just trying to do things. But now we realize, oh, they're, they're practicing all sorts of magic on our diplomats and on our uh, on Henry Kissinger. He even wrote a book like years later about how he had been deceived by him. Right. Hmm. And, and that they weren't what they said they were. And one time um, Kissinger goes to Mao and says, why did you want to talk to us? Because, by the way, it was the Chinese that wanted to talk to us, not us that wanted to talk to them. They made it look like it was Nixon that wanted to talk to the Chinese because they didn't want anybody to know that it was them initiating it. But mm. that was that Xi, by the way. And uh, so he goes to Mao, he says, why do you want to talk to us? What's going on? And Mao goes, because you're the bow. And Kissinger goes to the translator, what's that mean? He goes, uh, you're like the top dog in the neighborhood. I was, oh, okay. Well, it wasn't until later we found out that Bo has many translations. The main translation is because you're a friggin' tyrant. <laughs> 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 so, oh, you know, amazing. Chinese are very interesting. And I'm really kind of into that. I'm into Chinese alchemy and, and the Chinese mind is so different than the Western mind that it fascinates me. Um, but I don't think they're going to take over the West. I don't think they understand who we are. Uh, at all. I don't think they understand the Western mind's malleability. And we are very, uh, especially in America, we're really, really willing to change our attitude towards a life-threatening problem. And which is why we all have guns and everything, because we, we worked it out. We go, well, if I get rid of my guns, I got nobody to protect me. And, uh, and so, you know, Americans are this super practical people. And, you know, I, I guarantee the Chinese army doesn't want to come down my driveway. So, um, you know, I, I'm not afraid of China at all. I, I don't think they understand us. And I don't think they, I think that they they have an inherent weakness in that they're sun adverse. They don't like to go out in the sun. And I think that, that they're not getting enough, enough nutrients from the sun. Uh, my alchemy studies say that the sun is super important. And so sun adverse cultures are naturally going to be weaker. 
So you have a culture mm. like China and uh, India, who also is sun adverse, and uh, they're going to be weaker. And and we're not sun adverse. We're the exact opposite. And uh, so I think we're going to. I mean, I just think we're like a, a lot more malleable. And, and yeah. So I'm not worried. About, I actually not worried about anything. I think the United States is actually about to come out on top on every level. I think that we, um, you know, if we get rid of these woke people, uh, uh, that would be good. But um, uh, outside of that, you know, we have more river. Uh, we have 39,000 miles of rivers in the continental United States. Europe has 6,000. China has 7,000. Uh, all of our rivers run through the bread basket where all the food is grown. So, I mean, you look at, we got two oceans. We own Hawaii, which is the most strategic location on earth. Um, uh, the powers that run this country will never let it submit to anyone. And I've been told by somebody high up in the military that we have a weapon that is so terrible. And they've told everybody about it, all the leaders of the world, that mm. once they unleash this weapon, only humans die. Nothing is wrecked. No buildings are burned. No crops are burned. No animals die. Only humans die. And uh, they can kill an entire country in less than 24 hours. Wow. Well, that makes me think about the... Uh, uh, well, a lot of things actually. First thing I would mention is uh, we, when you mentioned the uh, Thanksgiving, I think that's really a great way to look at Thanksgiving. I prefer that uh, story to, to the one that we have because it actually has a lot more meaning to it. And when it comes to crossing the Delaware River, which Washington did, and I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, so that area was pretty darn close to where I was. And so I've stood on each side of that river where it may not be the exact spot, but where it's believed that he crossed. And right. there, there are some ruins and there's some archaeology that kind of lends to that probably being the case that he crossed there. People may not realize that at that point, that is not a small river. That's a really, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not like some stream that was frozen. It is far. And for that to have frozen, that, that would have been a, 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 a big deal. And it the was. plasma universe, um, you know the, the Grand Canyon. I would really recommend people if you look at look at pictures of it. Also, if you are if you happen to be there and you realize, just do look at that because it does look like a great big. Uh, if you've ever arc welded, you know if you've ever used you know uh, like a plasma cutter. I mean, it looks exactly like you, you'll see it with different eyes. Then when you start to look at it, you'll realize it doesn't make sense that water would have made these jagged edges and things. So you start That's realizing right. that that the universe is. Uh, uh, and, and our planet goes through some pretty extreme things. And at first it's unsettling, then eventually it's just, you'll get used to it. It's all right. Um, but also yep. w with the biolocation, with plasma, I know that you uh, you recently are starting uh, a, a Bigfoot project. I believe you put a YouTube out. And I just wanted to mention that you know, I'm very convinced that uh, Bigfoot can move instantly spot to spot silently because I've spent a lot of time hunting in the woods of uh, Washington State. And when you're out there, you're, you're out there and um, you get something called the feeling where you know he's around. It just yeah, okay. creeps you out. You're just, uh, you know, and you don't want to look up uh, and you know it's there and it passes. Um, I've definitely had trail cams messed with by Bigfoot because just I, it, nothing else would explain it. And, but I you had a time them around. You turn mine turns around. around. Yeah, turns mine them around. around. Yeah, and they also just disappear sometimes, and uh, it's it's odd. What and, I think is that he can see uh, the electromagnetic field. Yes. And so he sees the trail cam like 30 yards away. You know, like, come on, you guys. And he hears it because it's making a little a noise. You can hear it. Yeah. And um, also, I think he sees where the portals are, those temporary portals that are there and you know like in washington state they're everywhere especially with the rain because the rain really increases the the conductivity of the of the electricity so in washington state there's uh, all sorts of disappeared people up there especially in the olympics it's just like when i lived there it was like crazy i used to go out on search and rescue trying to find these people we wouldn't find them uh -huh. and there's all sorts of crazy stories but also all through the mountains of the west coast and in colorado there's just this, you know, a lot of UFO sightings and a lot of strange sightings of things. And it's they're like bleed through areas. 
Um, yeah. I had a, a friend who decided to take a day hike up Mount Shasta, he and his buddy. And so they parked, I think, at the 7,000 foot place and they're going to go up to 13,000 turn around. It was just a day hike. And they're going up there and they're hiking. It's the middle of the summer and they're up about, uh, you know, got about a couple thousand feet to go. And uh, my friend turns around and he goes, Hey, look. And they look and not on the trail, but on the, where the, where the uh, tree line had now disappeared. Right. And the snow was gone. They saw a woman running up the mountain, a blonde woman, about 25 years old, running up the mountain at like 35 miles an hour. And she mm. shot past them and they, she just disappeared somewhere. And they were like, what in the world was that? And, and again, Shasta is one of those places that has this kind of portal feel to it when you go there. And I think this is actually really important uh, work uh, that we need to get more researchers doing. Uh, we know from the arc welding of building ships that uh, wrenches would disappear. Um, I had my own encounter with these forces. I was working in a photography lab when I was trying to get through college and um, the crazy manager of the lab asked me to change a, a light fixture on the ceiling while the electricity was on and, I, and he didn't want to stop production. And uh, I said, okay, so I got myself a nice long screwdriver you know, and I, I had to hit that center screw and get it done and not hit the side. That's the key. The, uh, so I, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. I'm up on a chair. I got a friend's got a broom going to push me out of the way if I get something <laughs> happening. And, and, but of course I hit the side. You know, but, you know, I couldn't do it. So I hit the side and a huge explosion knocks me off the chair. I'm on the, my back. Um, there's smoke and in the air, really a nasty smell, metallic smell. And uh, all the lights went out, of course. And uh, I think I got fired. I can't remember. But anyway, <laughs> we, uh, we started looking for the mold, the, the metal from the screwdriver because I had to have the handle in my hand and it was uh, empty all the way to where it's inserted into the plastic handle. The entire 11 inch screwdriver was gone. And we thought it must be here, you know, molted somewhere, but we never found it. And that's what happened at the Grand Canyon. The lightning strike didn't hit and throw this stuff out. I'm solving the whole mystery. Oh, yeah. it. it disappeared. It just disappeared. Enough electrical energy causes stuff to disappear. And that's what these portals are. They're places where a temporary charge happens. Sometimes there's permanent portals and they can make portals too, like Stargate. So, and again, Stargate, they were using exactly what I said. They had a round thing, pumping electricity, tons of electricity into it. And then they would pass through it when the charge got high enough. So you have a high enough capacitor, you get it, you get it, you get it completely charged, and then bam, you hit it, and that charge goes into that thing. And for a few seconds, you've got enough power to let, literally make people disappear and go to other dimensions. It would make that's sense. It. That's it. Yeah. That's like the secret. Yeah, it's uh, along with uh, like you're mentioning uh, the the portals. It, it also kind of explains something that uh, a good number of people I've known have seen. Um, in Washington State was where you'd be in the middle of nowhere and people who know the woods there, you, 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 you're you out there, okay? You're in the middle of nowhere. And better have a GPS. Yeah, better have a GPS and, you know, and a compass and, and topological map. You better have some backups right. because uh, that, that GPS won't work under, under tree cover quite often. So um, one of the things people have seen is they'll just see a person in a suit walking through the forest. Or they'll see some... Yes, person in a suit, or it could be that's that's what it tends to be. Sometimes somebody running, like they're running from something through the woods, etc. That, that, that and they weren't as well dressed, you know. Um, but they'll just see these strange people kind of go past them. So they'll be in a tree stand and they'll see somebody walk through the forest, and there's no way, you know, you're just there's no way they could have gotten there, and there's nowhere that they're going, but they walked by. And so yeah, I wonder, are they are they in you know you might say multiple dimensions at once or something like that because. They can't be there, but they are. You know what I mean? Yeah, again, with all that moisture and those rock formations in Washington State, you're going to get a lot weirder electrical uh, effects than where I live, where it hardly ever rains. But uh, and, and, and we know that like places like England, where it's wet, 
get a lot more um, uh, ghost sightings and and things like that. And it's, it, there's something a, re a relationship between the interdimensional portals and places where it rains a lot. And I do know that. And again, even in places like in Central America where it rains a lot, those are known as uh, like mystical places to the natives. So you yeah, know, it rains every day, like in Washington State. Sometimes it'll rain every day for four or five years <laughs> for a year yeah for a year. Um, <laughs> and uh because if it rains in the uh, summer then it's going to rain for a year um well also i think about you know feeling the plasma um we're near sedona so you know that oh, and, and oh, man. since you were mentioning you know upper you know southern utah and, and sedona in the northern arizona sedona do, yeah you mentioned the rock structures they don't seem like they should be there because there's not rock structures like that anywhere else and they're so unique and um uh you know, ken rolla is backwards what's, sedona, what's that what's sedona backwards sedona anna anodes uh, anodes i i bet it is That's because what they are, anodes and anodes, I, named it oh, they say yeah. oh, after this guy's daughter or something right i never heard of the name sedona before in my life but i think the guy went out there and uh yeah. knew what he was looking at oh. And 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 so these are anodes, and they said, "Well, I'll just name my daughter Sedona, and then I'll say that's why we named the place Sedona." Anodes, I like that. That's right. It is. I get it. Oh, well, if, if somebody wants an easy feel of the plasma, go there, and you know, you don't have to sit on oh, a paper it vortex. There. Just because the whole thing is kind of a vortex. Ken Rolla, someone that we've had on the show, Ken Rolla, great character. Um, he mentioned that it's just one of the reasons that it has so much energy there. Also, is that there's so much quartz crystal under the ground. So he he says solid under the ground for a long ways. You've got quartz. So you that, have this that's natural. That's what we have here in the San Luis Valley, and that was why we have all these crazy UFO sightings and everything. It's the quartz. It's in everything, mm -hmm. and it causes the charges. And the Bigfoot yeah. sees where those the Bigfoot is now mapped, where those high charge quartz areas are, right? And he knows that if he's in trouble, pew, runs out. Yeah, way. yeah. And I just and I was mentioned. Yeah, when I um I did have a Bigfoot encounter or two, and when I was I in Washington State, and one was, and I actually have a picture of it. It's a little bit of a distance, so it's not something really clear, but you'll a person will recognize what it is. Um, First, it's about 150 yards away, and then uh, I'm walking on a trail, and then I look again. I take a, take a couple steps, look again. He's about 100 yards away, and then I take a few more steps. He's about 50 or 70 yards away, and you know I'm not a brave person, but I mean it's just too sublime. I really wasn't scared because it just blows your mind. Yeah. You know, you're like I don't know how to. There's no way to react to this, right? So yeah. I figure, all right, you know, next time I look, is he going to be like standing there? Well, he had disappeared. But the thing is, he was moving like 50 yard increments instantly with no sound and no hassle. And I didn't see him moving. And I was thinking to myself, this thing moves instantly where it wants to go, because there's no it's, way you couldn't move that far that fast. And you couldn't do it without making noise. That I, I've seen uh, the, the witnesses have told me that um, he ha they have an uncanny ability to know where to put their feet. So they don't mm. make any noise. It's wow. almost like a ballet, like ballet dancer thing. And um, they uh, are seriously fast. And it, I mean fast. I mean, when they want to move, they could move silently and so fast it's blinding. I, I, I mean, uh, I have a friend who saw one cross a, a place. I would say it's a meadow surrounded by forest three football fields big this meadow um where you know it's perfect because you can see the wildlife the deer and the elk and if you're hunting you know it's just like absolutely yeah. best to be and uh because it's a stream and everything it's a bog and he said this thing went across it in like 20 seconds and he, that's and the yeah. were enormous and um so i don't know what it is but i'm going to find out and um I now have a nest and uh, where I can go and, and investigate it, and I, I'll have a lot more uh, information. But um, so it's really one of the most fascinating subjects to think that there's a, you know, t eight to ten foot tall humanoid who's probably got a higher IQ than we do out in the woods, and you know, it's it's actually jaw dropping. And, oh, it definitely is. Yeah, it is. And, yeah. you know, uh, you've been lucky enough to see one. I haven't. But I've seen the remnants. I've seen the scat. I've seen the, a lot of other stuff. So 
I know they're there. My friends don't lie to me. They, they oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. There's there's so many people that I know of, like from Washington State alone that they're just not people who would lie. You know, I, I knew two guys who were fishing in the in the small little fishing boats out on, on a river, and uh, from out of nowhere, a big ass tree trunk came flying and landed right between them. And that's nothing anyone could have thrown. And they were far from anywhere. Nobody's pranking them. I mean, something through that that was massive with incredible accuracy because it didn't hurt them. It landed right between them perfectly, you know, yeah, and that my, way they uh, freaked him out. My friend Jack Carey was uh, down in New Mexico at a place that's hot. And um, he said that a, a grapefruit sized rock. Yes. Shot one inch past his ear hit the aspen tree behind him and broke it in two. I mean, <laughs> right? And he yeah. got out of there. He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take the hint. I'll take the hint. <laughs> yeah, definitely um, leave the area. If they don't want you there, get out because they will they will break you. I mean, if Yeah, you, we, we, we don't know that they haven't hurt people. We just don't they have, know. You know? They have. They yeah. Have. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, when you're walking down the path and you hit a Bigfoot and he's got an abscessed tooth, you know, he's in a bad mood and there you are in his territory and must put you out like a cigarette. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, well, you know, there's a video I saw actually this morning about it was uh, there's a lot of these walk around videos that are kind of uh, becoming popular right now where somebody walks around Moscow. They walk around here, walk around there. Yeah. And it's great because, you know, a good day with light, you know, 4K camera and you can see it's very nice. Somebody recently did one in Hyundai. Hende. And really? uh, they, yeah, and I'll send it to you. Uh, 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 yeah, they, please. they, it's recent and they actually ended it. It's only a couple minutes. They walked around, place isn't very big, but they ended it at the, uh, no, no, almost, almost at the end, they actually walked to where the cross is and it looked like it's been restored. It was clean, it was sharp looking. So yeah. maybe it's been, I'll, I'll send it to you because you can, you can yeah. see what you think. It, if nothing else, it's definitely been cleaned and it doesn't look like it. I, I didn't see much uh, weather wear on it. So maybe that's kind of a unique omen, you know, that somebody's cleaned up it the cross of Hende. It could be that the townspeople, I mean, started realizing that there were an awful lot of tourists coming into town to see it. And so they decided to spruce it back up, got a mason in there to, you know, fi fix it back up because it was eroding really badly. It, was all it definitely looks problem. better. Definitely looks better. It was really it's sharp. For you guys, France, you know, they are a class act. I got to tell you, you say whatever you want about the French. You go to France, the food is great. The art is great. The women are beautiful. The countryside is great. You know, what oh, do you yeah. want to say about the French? They are a class act. Oh, yeah. The Maginot line is really badass. <laughs> I mean, you yes. can't beat it. Well, uh, um, one thing you mentioned about the uh, in World War II, how I forget who you mentioned that with. I think it was with uh, Rex Bear that that could have been, you know, positioning for the next uh, 400 year cycle. And it would kind of make sense because so the Germans had the Anunnaki who were looking for, you know, arcane knowledge had Himmler heading that up. But I'm not sure if we know. I mean, there's people still researching it, of course, but I don't know if we know everything about the Anunnaki. And because one thing is these weren't necessarily eclectic people. A lot of them, and they and there was a lot involved in the Anunnaki. So to me, I don't know if uh, Himmler's sort of you know wanting to find the origins of the Nordic race and such really would have worked. It seems to me like there would have had to have been something more tangible that they were doing. And when the way, the way you put it that way, that they could have been positioning, like you're saying, for the next 400 year cycle, which is coming up, that would make sense why you'd have an Anunnaki and and why they'd be going around the world looking for stuff. Well, the um, so um, the whole thing was an operation from the start, and uh, it's very likely that um, uh, the guy with the funny mustache was a, a British agent uh, of some kind, and um, and that the entire thing was set up by the British royal family and and their bankers to um fund the secret operation of which was going to be like finding the holy grail of, of the occult and the, and the knowledge and to spend a lot of resources on it because they believed well they knew about the cross of Hende. that's 
that was their groups that, that helped build it. And they knew all about it. And they knew they were getting close to the time. And I believe that uh, when the, the French guy, I'm going to forget his name, he deciphered the Mayan calendar near the end of the 1800s. And I think when he, he came up with the date of December 21st, 2012, and I think that spooked them a little bit. So in 18, 1890, they had this date of 2012 from the Mayan calendar, and it was clearly a solar calendar. So they got kind of spooked because they weren't sure exactly what the date was. They knew it was coming, but they weren't sure where. And so I think they sped up the process. And that's what uh, the thing in Germany was all about. And so they sped up the process. And then he had to use, you know, the invasion of Poland and all these other things to cover up all these expeditions that were going everywhere being funded by the Royals and the bankers. Uh, so, it, and then what they did is they had the top occult people, the top Freemasons were directing the Anunnaki as to what to do and to where to go. And I believe they were using uh, the same books that Fulconelli read and the same books that I read uh, as their guides as to where the important stuff was. And, uh, it, it really explains a lot, like um, Hitler invading um, Stalingrad, right? Well, what a, what a dumbass move, you know? And, yeah. Uh, but why would you do that? And the answer would be uh, to continue the war, make it go on longer, uh, to make everything just elongated so this other project, Project X, I call it, um, could go. And by the way, Project X was started by, by Napoleon. So we're talking... 1820, uh, Project X, I believe, began. Napoleon went to Egypt and and all of that. That's all part of this long-term project that culminated at the end of World War II when they had completed their survey of everything, the whole world. That's what the Germans were doing. They were surveying every single place. They now knew everywhere, and they now knew everything. And if you were going to... If you and then and then began the program immediately after World War II of mind control, MK Ultra, and all the mind control programs began right away, including on me and my generation of TV, and it was just all mind control, and mind programming uh, to make us conform to an idea that everything was stable, everything was a, mm. a, a flat line, you never have to worry about anything because everything isn't stable, but they want you to think that while they're doing what they're doing, building deep underground military bases, creating secret space program, Project Horizon on the moon, and doing all these things. There's a reason for all this. And they and the reason is exactly what I'm stating. And uh, the, the, uh, it explains everything that's happened from World War II to this moment. And now we are at the place where they're going to... Um, say goodbye to a lot of us and um, creating a more manageable situation maybe, and maybe also making a situation where there won't be mass rioters coming to their doors to get food. And um, because that's the next level of what this split, where this place is heading is going yeah. to be food shortages and um, cold and electromagnetic reversals, and uh, and they know it, and they know it. That's why they're telling us it's warming up, and we're seeing it, and that's the thing. So I, I was going to mention that uh, um, people. So with the four hundred year cycle that we're talking about, I guess that kind of is or or correlates with the uh, grand solar minimum that's happening. So our our shields are very very down right now, and of course we're seeing how. It's getting a little, a little sketchy right now when it comes to some of the CMEs and solar flares that we're having because our, our KP index was up in the sixes and the sevens. And of course, it's still, you know, three and four right now, days after. So we're very, very vulnerable. And of course, as Robert Felix said, you know, we're getting a lot more cosmic rays. So that creates these evolutionary leaps. So it seems to me that people are feeling this. That's one thing. Uh, those who are, I call them, you know, natural humans who have their instinct and have their, you know, both their physical and their like connected to source, God instinct, um, they're feeling it. I mean, are you getting, are, are you seeing that? Because to me, most people I know who are, you know, I, I just humbly say a bit awake, right? They're, they're, they have their instincts intact. They feel weird. 
they feel strange. They they're getting used to it, but they feel that there is change in the energy. They basically they're feeling the sun. Yeah, the sun's frying us, and um, you know, um, you need to you 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 need to go out into the sun. Okay, it's very important that you um, don't be shy of the sun. So go out, maybe you only go out in the morning or in the afternoon when the sun's starting to go down, but don't shy away from going out into the sun. Those energies are strange and, and weird, and yes, we all feel them, but they're there. You, 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 you got to get used to it as fast as possible. And by sheltering yourself and staying inside in the dark, you're not helping yourself at all. So um, uh, you do have to go out into the sun. You, as Cliff High says, you got to sun your balls. And, uh, you know, take off your pants. And I'm serious. And I say that. Take, mm -hmm. You can literally get naked and lay out in the sun for 15, 20 minutes every day. Just do it. Just, believe me, you will feel better. And so, yeah, the, I, sun I, I said, so you know, homeopathy, you go into the disease, right? You, you go mm -hmm. into it. You take it. And that's what this is. If this is a sun disease, and it is, corona is the sun, then you need to go into that disease. You need to absorb the sunlight. I guarantee you, if you do that, you will probably avoid most illnesses. You live in Sedona too, so you get plenty of sunshine there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of sun here. That's what you're, our, our UV index is like average 12 before noon yeah. sometimes. So same we're getting here. plenty of the radiation. Um, yeah, well, one thing about the, uh, Ananabi, just to touch on that a little bit, one more different way is that, of course, we all know about paperclip. We all know we got the, you know, German scientists came this way, the rocket scientists. And of course, the Germans doing phenomenal things with rockets back then. I mean, the first analog computer was, I think, on the V2 or the one that was after it still in production. So, I mean, they were doing phenomenal stuff. It wasn't really that effective in the war effort, but they did create a lot of technology. And so we know about paperclip that came over here. And one thing about history is there's so much, we, we don't even know what happened in the 30s and the 40s as, as that war came to an end, because um, this is something that, uh, uh, what's his name? I'll, it'll come to me in a sec. Uh, 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 anyway, um, uh, Tina von Struckman and another guy, oh, Joseph Farrell. You know, and if you look at their work that they've done, and Joseph Farrell wrote this in Nazi Official, uh, uh, yeah, not Nazi uh, International, his one of his recent books, is that you know the uh, Bormann and such made a deal, and they put uranium and they put the uh, infrared blasting you know, uh, uh, detonators that we needed, and a and a MG two six two and such in a, in a submarine, and then we allowed it to get over to Norfolk, and we um, and we uh, and the when we actually when Japan was nuked, you know, when those two cities were, were nuked, that was a, actually really a, a German and American joint venture because that, that, that bomb was American parts and German detonators and some German uranium, Yep. you know, yep. and people oh, don't know right. that. No. Nope. Yeah. People do not know that. And then I start wondering about, so really not only is there, you know, paperclip, is there really on a Naba clip, you know, how much of that data that the Germans were collecting now, how much do we, do we know? How much of that came over? That's that's the thing I think we're going to find. We may find out a lot more about that in the near future, I have a feeling. Well, I think all through the entire military industrial complex at the end of World War II, uh, including intelligence agencies, were all taken over by the Germans. Um, and that's what was going on. During the whole period, they were learning all these skills that nobody in the world knew about, like MK Ultra, uh, and how to influence and control populations and the project was now complete and America was a place where you now take that project and we go worldwide with it. And since we have the resources to do it. And so that's why they, none of the stuff that they invented was really intended to win the war. That there was never ever an intention to win the war. The intention was to always lose the war and, uh, um, and, and they did lose the war and uh, um, uh, the project was over. As soon as the project was over, and I don't know what that final thing was in their project, but once they discovered that one thing that was, okay, we're done, let's end the war, and the end of the war. And that was it. It was over. And it created D-Day and ended the Germans and blew out the uh, Japanese and that part, 
And even the Japanese may be part of this plot plan, by the way. There's a lot of um, a lot of evidence that the Japanese, too, were doing kind of Anunnaki stuff in China and Asia. Uh, so they may have been the other branch of this thing. And, you know, what people don't realize is that the Japanese people um, are, when they arrived, when the, and when the Asian people arrived on Japan, it was peopled by white people called the um, Anu. And the Anu and the Asians interbred and created the Japanese. And the Japanese think that they are far superior to all the other Asians. Uh, they do, believe me, I've talked to them. And uh, <laughs> they believe they are racially um, uh, superior. And, um, and so they, that is why Hitler did an alliance with them. Why would Hitler do an alliance with a group that wasn't white if he believed in, in Aryan supremacy? Well, he found out their history, and then he found out that they did have this bloodline in them. And so therefore, they were it now okay. And so I think that that's also what's going on. I think that, I think that the Japanese were doing their own honor and in, in Wow. And going into Chinese places and getting Chinese alchemy and, and all sorts of other things. Mm. And of course, it now took over China and completely destroyed all of those things. So it was oh, like the Japanese did. came in, picked them all up, took them to Japan, and then eventually made its way to America, all these esoteric things that were in China. And then the Chinese came in, Mao didn't believe in anything esoteric, so he just destroyed the whole thing. First thing he did. Mm. And that's why something as as you study, you know, World War II, and you you look at it, 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 the sides become very blurred, and you start realizing, you know, it just seems like, yeah, more of a coordinated effort that appeared to have sides that didn't really. And uh, you mentioned yeah. how, when that chapter was added to uh, this book, the um, in 1957, when the uh, chapter, and if you find this book out there. The, uh, the, uh, the Mystery of the Cathedral, uh, Cathedrals by Fulcinelli, you might find that a lot of the versions of it are missing the chapter about the, the cross, but that's in the appendix of this book here. So you can, you can, you can find it there. Um, so that, 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 that was added in 1957, and then we find that that's when underground bases started to be made and such like that. But like one last thing I would just touch on with War II is that awesome. many, people, many people don't know that the Germans were building the crap out of underground bases that were huge, and we, don't even, we haven't even found them all. And you know, Europe isn't that big, and we don't know where they all are. They're still finding them, and some of those were massive. Like the whole MG2, the, the yeah. first fighter, uh, well, one of the first jet fighters, the one that really worked, the MG262, made underground. The V2 project, yeah. made underground. And people don't know, these things are epic. They are huge. And yeah, why they JFK, make those underground. JFK mm. visited those in 1945 when he was a young congressman. Um, wow. He went there and visited, and he saw all of the German equipment and came back and was like blown away and – I was telling everybody that the Germans had achieved zero G and free energy and, and this stuff's going to get released and we're going to make the world a better place. And, and then it never got released and never got released. And then he became president and then he tried to trick him into releasing it. And, and you know, he ran a little issue. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, listen, I, man, I got to get going, um, but it's been great talking to you. Oh, it certainly has been. Yeah, thank you for your time today. I'm glad we covered yeah. a lot of ground. And um, well, so. I'll, I'll send you a link when I get this up. Thank you so much um, for being on the show. Yeah, you bet. All thank right. Thank you. Bye.